This podcast of Words of Power with Joey DeMaio is brought to you by Valhalla Studios NY.com, your destination for immersive recording, mixing, and mastering. Valhalla Studios New York combines state-of-the-art equipment with award-winning engineers. Check it out. Welcome to Words of Power with Joey DeMaio. I'm Joey DeMaio, founder and bassist of the band Man of War. I'm also a record producer, entrepreneur, and a public speaker. In this podcast, I speak about words and values that I believe can help us all to live a powerful life. And I invite people that I find interesting and inspiring to join us on that journey. In today's episode, I speak about the legendary Orson Welles, who I had the honor to work with. He recorded narrations for the songs Defender and Dark Avenger. I am joined for this episode by Magic Circle's creative director, Suzanne Wagner, who has a background in film from her previous career at Universal Studios Home Entertainment. If you're enjoying this podcast, please make sure to rate it and leave a positive review on your favorite podcasting platform. And don't forget to subscribe so you get new episodes automatically delivered to you. Also, visit me on social media. Let me know what you think of this episode and what you'd like to hear about. My username on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter is Real Joey DeMaio. So welcome, Suzanne. What do you have to say today? Well, you know, we had asked your fans and the Man of War fans out there to let us know what they're interested in. And one of the recurring topics that come up is people want to hear about recording the great Orson Welles. And he really was a legend, right? Without a doubt. I mean, for anybody who has ever watched any of the big, big movies that were made before CGI, big budget, for instance, biblical movies or adventure movies, you would always hear his voice, which was one of the most profound and amazing speaking voices in the world, without a doubt, and certainly in the whole of Hollywood. But beyond his voice, which was just one of his many gifts, he was a person who revolutionized cinema and films. He was the first person to actually use the camera as a human being, as a human being's perspective, so to say. And uh, he changed the face of the world. When he made a movie called Citizen Kane, he truly changed the whole business in terms of where he put cameras, way up on cranes and way down, digging underneath the ground to get an upper perspective and having the camera follow the person around. You know, I could go on forever about how he changed the movie industry, but people can certainly read about that. I mean, my story is is, is a personal one. And I grew up not even knowing who he was, but I had his voice in the back of my head, as I said, from all the movies that I've heard his voice in all my life. And when we came to deal with the recording of Battle Hymns, the song Dark Avenger was written along with actually uh, early versions of Defender as well. And it was up to us to figure out how to bring that song to life and originally we thought maybe Eric could speak it, but then he had to sing it. And because the dialogue there changes from the person who's singing to the person who's speaking, and the same with Defender, it required two people. And of course, you know, when it came to speaking, that voice of his was like Eric's voice to singing. And so we talked about it with uh, Bob Curry from our record company, who was the visionary that signed Man of War. And, you know, we explained the meaning of the song and what's going on. And I said, we really need to have somebody that can narrate this song and do justice to it. You know, somebody with a bigger than than life voice, somebody like Orson Welles. And he just looked at me and said, well, why don't we just get Orson Welles? And I said, you're kidding. And he said, no, why, why would I be kidding? I couldn't believe it. You know, it was like a joke. But here we were with EMI Records at that time. Liberty was the name of the label. And he said, no, I'll just, you know, I'll just try and get a hold of him. What's the difference? Can't hurt to try. And I was like, oh, that would be amazing. And of course, I went home and, you know, told my parents, you know, and they're, and they're like, well, why would he do that? I mean, he's Orson Welles. And I'm like, yeah, I know, but we're going to try. And Bob sent him the lyrics. And I have the letter somewhere. But basically, we got a response and it was positive. And we were just completely blown away that this great man who had achieved so much in so many areas. I mean, remember, he was not only a filmmaker, he was a writer, an actor, a director, a film editor 
editor. He did magic tricks. I mean, I, I can't even tell you all the things this amazing man did. And here we've got a letter saying he would consider recording the songs with us. For a completely unknown band. I mean, it was your debut album. We were just blown away. I mean, what can I say? It was just one of the most amazing things to think that this was really going to happen. And lo and behold, just the strength of the lyrics, he was in. And the day finally came. We, we were in Florida recording, and we set a time and date to meet. And we were hoping he was going to come to Florida because, you know, we were all there. But he was coming to New York, I think, to receive an award, or he had just received a big award from France, some Medal of Honor or something. So we flew to New York, and I believe it was Media Sound Studios, which was one of the big studios in New York then. And we walked in, and the guy from the record company, Bob, said to me, you know, come on, you guys, he's here. I go, he's here? He goes, yes. And, you know, he's amazing. He's really bigger than life. And truly, this is not an insult or, or anything like that, just the opposite. He was bigger than life. They actually brought him up in the freight elevator. He was a big guy, and he had a lot of stuff with him. I think he had a dog with him as well. But we're hurrying up to get into the hallway, and I hear this voice through the hallway. Now, remember, he was in the recording room. So the sound I heard was from his voice through the microphone through the control room monitors, and the control room door must have been open, and I was already way down the hallway, you know, probably about 20 seconds away from getting into the control room, and I hear, Has the author arrived yet? And I had this big voice, and I'm like, well, who, who's the author? And the guy from the record company goes, It's you! I go, oh, the, you know, I didn't think, oh, author. I was thinking author means novel. You know, but in professional terms, you know, it meant the person who had actually written the written text. So, yeah, you know, by that time I got into the control room and I, you know, pushed the button and I said, oh, oh yes, yes, sir, I'm here. And uh, so he said, all right, then let's begin. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. And I'm standing there and uh, the engineer looks at me and he said, uh, well, there's the producer's chair. And I looked at him and the guy from the record company goes, that's you get over there. And I'm like, you know, I just remember thinking to myself, oh, wait a minute, I'm going to be telling this guy what to say, how to say it, how fast to say it. It was just, you know, it was one of those moments. I froze in time, like in my brain. I had a brain freeze, like when you have too much ice cream. You know what I mean? When yeah, you just eat yeah. it too fast and all of a sudden your brain freezes. Well, you realize you're standing in front of the person that is considered one of the greatest directors, actors of all time. Here is you, supposed to tell him how to do his job. I couldn't believe I was going to do it. I, I just, you know, I thought I'd offend him or I thought I'd make a fool out of myself or say the wrong things. And, you know, all these things go through your head, you know, particularly in, at such an early age. But he was just amazing to work with when I had to push the talk button. You know, in a recording studio, you're completely isolated from the performers. You can see each other. But unless you have microphones to speak to each other, you can't communicate. I could see him, he could see me, and I would you know, push the microphone to talk at the talk button. And uh, I'll never forget the first time I said, oh, um, Mr. Wells, do you think you could uh, say that line there uh, when he wrote up from hell with a little more power? And he's like, yes, okay, let's do it again. And I heard him go, and he wrote up from hell. I'm like... Oh, yes, that's what we want. We want more of that. And I'll never forget, we were just looking at each other in the control room and just making the face like, oh, my God, can you believe this? When we heard his voice come through the monitors, it was like thunder. It was unbelievable. It, it, it was just an experience you can't imagine because he had this huge, big, resonant voice. I'll never forget saying to the recording engineer, what kind of EQ do you have on his voice? And for those of you that don't know, EQ is short for equalization, which means being able to make something brighter or more bassy, the same controls we have on our stereos at home or cars. He said, nothing really, just a little bit of uh, compression on his voice. And I just couldn't believe it. He was recorded basically flat and it was thunderous. It was amazing. 
you know, he delivered and he did everything I asked. He was actually speaking too fast. And of course, the song was longer and the pieces that he was talking in were longer. So I had to ask him to slow down a couple times and speak it slower. And he was just happy to do it. It was explained to him, you know, how much we idolized him and how we were doing everything ourselves. You know, we had managed to get our own record deal. We were recording the record, you know, producing it, and had written all the music, and much in the same way that he was responsible for all areas of his films and plays and, you know, radio shows and everything that he did. He was a very hands-on guy. Let's jump into that a little bit because not everyone will know that. And there are people out there thinking because a movie was filmed in black and white, it's not worth watching. Yeah, he was, he was known as the boy genius. He had made his mark actually in radio theater where people would gather around and read incredible stories and act them out on radio. That's where he to made his mark. To the point that when he did War of the Worlds on the radio, people thought aliens had invaded. Oh, people jumped out the window and killed themselves. They believed that aliens were invading. That's right. He had a radio show, and on the radio show, he did a program about the War of the Worlds, which was later made into a movie. When these people, who were professional actors, acted it out, yelling and screaming, oh, the aliens are coming, they're going to kill us, people on, in those days didn't have the access to the information we have today, and they just flip. It was a tragedy and it was terrible. And it just, it went to show the kind of director he was to get these performances that were so lifelike. To say they believed it is an understatement. So the tragedy of some suicides aside, it really impressed the Hollywood studios. And he ended up getting a deal with RKO where he got something that was incredibly special, meaning that he got free hand, whatever he wanted to do, choosing the topic of his first movie, how to do it. He got Final Cut, which especially in this day was unheard of. And he went on to do the infamous Citizen Kane. That's right. He had carte blanche when he went to Hollywood and he waited until he could make the movie that he wanted to make. I certainly have been inspired by that, and I know the feeling saying that he was so difficult to work with because it's hard enough to make something. It's easy enough to fuck it up yourself. But when you've made something, you've put your heart, soul, and blood, balls, and sweat into it, and it's the very best you can do, and you've slaved and suffered, and, and you're handing it off to sometimes to people who don't care as much, who don't care, or worse yet, people who really care, and then they leave the company within a week after you've delivered it, and then some new person comes in, you know what I mean? And all of a sudden, you see all of that blood and sweat and love and pain. Sometimes years of preparation. Years of preparation, years of work, and then in an instant, it's gone, and you're fucked. And then it doesn't sell, and then all of a sudden, nobody points to the record company or the movie company and says, oh, you had a flop. They say he had a flop. Oh, well, he didn't write the right song. Oh, he didn't make the right movie. And that's why when he made that first film, he had to have complete control. He changed the course of filmmaking and he changed the course of history and he influenced a lot of people. And after that, you saw more artists having their own production companies, more actors having their own production companies and, and so forth. And change is, is a hard thing to affect. Somebody's got to pay the price. People have to suffer. I think he paid the price because not everything went so smoothly after Citizen Kane and he, he had several other very successful movies, but then things took a turn. I don't know if it was because he was working for other studios or whatever the background was, but he ended up being in situations where he did not have the complete control and then things really got out of hand. And I was just thinking as we were talking here that if both of you, when you were recording Defender, could have looked into the future, you would have recognized that there were a lot of parallels between his career and what happened in your career, like people trying to take over on projects and things not going the way that you had envisioned, as you just uh, pointed out. I stick with what I want, and if you don't want to do it for me, then I'll have to be with That's someone else. That's the problem, isn't it? You do something, and somebody comes along, 
from, let's just say, a record company. It's the easiest example. You do something. You get on stage. You play a certain way. You look a certain way. You do a certain thing. It's, it's your thing, and you're different. And somebody from a record company comes up to you and goes, oh, my God, you're different. I want to sign you. I'm going to bring you to the record company. I'm going to fight for you to get signed. I believe in this. I think it's going to sell because it's so unique. And then you get there, and now you've got a team of people sitting around going, yeah, but it's a little too this, it's a little too that. Right. I mean, how do they know what you as the artist have in mind? Well, if you read enough about different bands, I mean, so many stories are the same that the band started having success when they started producing and doing their own records and so forth, because you hear something in your head, and that's what you think it should be. And it doesn't mean we're always right, but it means you should have the chance to at least record it and listen to it, you know, and see how the other, you know, what the other band members think and so forth, you know. That's a, a, a continuing story. When a band is in the charts selling, all of a sudden, the first thing that's discussed in the record company is, well, who's the engineer? Okay, hire him. Well, who's the producer? Okay, hire him. And the originality of the band can go out the window. It's not an unfamiliar story of how many bands were amazing, and then all of a sudden they made a first record and it didn't sound anything like what the band sounded like live. It's this decision, do you want to listen to the studio or the label because they promise you it's uh, going to be a sure success, and then you bend over backwards to do what pleases them and hope that they are right, or do you say, yeah, that may be the route that you suggest, but I have something in my head. I am the artist, and I'm going to go that route. The song Kingdom Come is a good example. When we had delivered the record, immediately the record company thought, well, if we have a chance to get any song on the radio, it's got to be the song Kingdom Come. But that mix that you guys got on the, on the record is not the right mix to be used um, for a video or for radio play in America. There was a station called Z-Rock and there were a lot of stations that would play rock records. You know, that was the time, right, 1988. So they said, well, we think you should go in the studio with a guy who's known for mixing these kind of records. And he was a famous engineer and he was a very nice guy. And let's, uh, let's have him do a mix of the record. You know, you could be there to make sure it goes the way you want and, and so forth. I'm like, okay, yeah, let's hear it. Because unless I hear it through the speakers in the studio and try it, I don't know. And when we're in the studio working, if, if somebody says, oh, well, let's try this or let's try that, we do it. Like, you know, if Eric says, well, you know, what, what if, uh, the, you know, the drums do this or that? Well, how the fuck do I know? How does anybody know? You can get lost in that process, but when you're in a band and you have people that care about what they're doing, you have a responsibility there, and you, you've got to try these things to see what works out. And so when you do this, you find out what's going on. So I said, sure, let's do the mix. So we did a mix of it, and we brought it to the head of radio at the record company, and the guy who was in charge of it and, and trying to get the song on the radio just said, no, nope, not going to do it. And uh, I'm standing there, and he said, I'm not going to bastardize this band. This band is a pure band. I can hear the vision. I can hear what's going on. Not going to do it. I don't believe in it. Only the second time I heard somebody stand up for the band and say, no, I'm not going to fucking dilute this band and make this band, you know, some wimped out band. This guy knew from the inner workings of these huge record companies, that that would have been the first step, you know what I mean, to a long line of starting to chip away and chip away, chip away, and after a while, you got a crack in the wall and keep chipping away, and then all of a sudden it's a big hole, and then after that, then the wall falls down, and then you end up being a completely different band than where you started. You know, so by the time The Kings of Metal being our sixth album, we had already been established worldwide. And then that was the last time anybody ever suggested anything or even mentioned the word radio. I mean, after that, it was a word that was dead to us. You know what you just said about the record label trying to change an artist to comply with whatever they think is the right thing. It truly is the same with the fans. I, I know that on social media, 
fans or they claim they are fans, they say, oh, do exactly what you did with the first three albums. And why does the recent album not sound like the old work? But you just can't please everyone. The ones that say it sounds the same and it's a good thing. The others say it sounds the same and that's a bad thing. And at the end of the day, you as the artist have to do what's in your heart and your mind, right? I'll never forget when I called the record company and said, okay, I'm going to start the new record now and I need, uh, I need the money and I need X amount of dollars right now to get started. They almost fell off their chair when I said, I, I'm going to record a pipe organ and a choir and an orchestra. And they're like, what for? I said, well, that's going to be our new record. Uh, it's going to be called Kings of Metal. And they said, well, if it's so metal, why do you need pipe organ and orchestra and choir? Heavy metal doesn't need that. So anyway, right after the record was done and I turned it in, they were like, yeah, okay, we'll see what we can do with it. Well, when, of course, the sales for you know, Kings of Metal were very, very impressive, the record company, it wasn't a week later. It was like, yeah, that's that's a good record. Uh, when are you going to do part two? Yeah, that's good. That orchestra, that's really good. And that pipe organ, you know? So those are things that happened. And there was a lot of pressure back then to do Kings of Metal part two. And I just wouldn't do it because I don't want to repeat myself, you know? Although I like the idea of maybe doing Kings of Metal part two, you know, now because it's been, I don't know, what's it been, 30 years since then. Now I would do it because I, I would want to do it, but I wouldn't be pushed into doing it. And I certainly wouldn't have done it because, you know, the record company thought they could just, you know, sell another X amount of records. No way. You know, my heart wouldn't have been in that. That's for sure. And I think that's a nice way to circle back to Orson Welles that when you have a vision for something, when you create art, you don't do it with the thought in mind how digestible it will be or how easy people can consume it or understand it. You are an artist and you create art. And if it works for people, it's great. If it only works for a few people, that's the way it is. And I'm, I'm thinking about that because uh, I watched a documentary on his career and how he had this movie idea that he so wanted to produce and no one gave him the money to do so. But it was just something he had to do and he did whatever he needed. Yeah, and it's the same with, uh, I think it was George Lucas. He had the script written, I think, in 10th grade in high school, if I'm correct. And he uh, let his, I think his drama teacher read it and the teacher said oh yeah this is crap nobody's gonna want this this is nothing but that was his dream and he held on to it and uh i don't know how much success the drama teacher ever had <laughs> and it goes to show you have to believe in yourself and follow your dream and see where it takes you that's right this was words of power with joey DeMaio. thank you for joining if you enjoyed this podcast Please leave a rating and a review on your favorite podcasting platform and make sure to subscribe and receive new episodes automatically. Also, if you have a friend or a family member who could use some inspiration and encouragement, let them know about this show. You can also paste a link to this podcast in a group email or group message to your friends. Also, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to get constant updates. My username is Real Joey DeMaio. Thanks again for joining me on this journey. Remember, you can achieve your dreams. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Have a great day and live a powerful life.